During the Shibuya incident, Ryoman Sakuna was once again fully incarnated within Yuji Itadori. We've seen this before, but never really on this level of lethality. Previous incarnations all occurred when his power had greatly weakened, never even close to 50% of his original power. Shibuya had Sakuna display the absolute pinnacle of special grade. He had reached a total of 15 fingers. He's not as strong as he once was, and he's definitely not the strongest form of Sakuna that we've ever seen. But he's still far stronger than what you might think, which is exactly what I'll be covering in today's video. Starting off, I'll explain what exactly is 15 finger Sakuna, or Sakuna at 15 fingers worth of his original power. Back during the Heian era, many sorcerers entered what's probably a binding vow to accept Kenjaku's offer to join the Culling Games. Sakuna was most likely one of these sorcerers, however Angel claims that the Fallen is different. Kenjaku split the souls of the participants in the cursed objects. These sorcerers will later be incarnated into the current players of the Culling Games. Sakuna most likely also learned how to perform this technique himself after observing Kenjaku. That technique is exactly what Sakuna activates on himself before transferring vessels into Megami Fushiguro. When originally split into cursed objects, Sakuna's soul was divided into 20 parts and sealed within his fingers. These fingers now became classified as special grade cursed objects that contained Ryom and Sakuna. There's a debate between exactly how much power was stored between each finger, with many believing that their power isn't divided evenly. Initially, you would think that Sakuna's power being divided into 20 parts would mean that each finger restores 1 20th of his original power, but other statements regarding the power of each finger growing over time bring that same idea into question. Assuming the fingers do actually increase in power over time, they'd never truly be equal. However, both of these claims are debatable, but the strength of the fingers aren't really the topic of today's video. Regardless if the power between each finger is linear or even exponential, Sukuna after consuming those same 15 fingers is insanely powerful. Even looking back at when Sukuna had only consumed about 3 fingers, he's still incredibly powerful. His second incarnation happened after the detention center incident, where Sukuna originally appeared after Yuji had lost control during his fight with the finger bear. When incarnating again, Sakuna hadn't consumed three fingers. This is actually two finger Sakuna. He'll later swallow his third finger after defeating the curse spirit, but even before then, he continues to dominate his opponent. Both of these fighters are classified in their own division of special grade as cursed objects, but the gap between Sakuna and the cursed spirit makes them seem like they're worlds apart. Sakuna can easily block his raw cursed energy blast with his bare hands. Even cleanly ripping off its arm isn't really an issue. Both his cursed energy control and manipulation is already unparalleled. Even using the reverse curse technique can seem so simple. Sukuna repairs Yuji's arm completely by mistake, almost like he had done it subconsciously. That's the same feat using reverse curse technique that Ryu mentions might be impossible for a special grade like Oro. Sukuna had replicated that same feat subconsciously only at two fingers worth of his original power. Two finger Sukuna is even capable of expanding Malevolent Shrine, which he then used to tear the curse spirit to shreds. He then consumed his third finger, making him three finger Sukuna. Both Megami and his ten shadow summonings get absolutely violated by Sukuna. Megami says that Sukuna is an incarnation, so he obviously doesn't need a heart to survive, but regardless, not having a heart is still damage to his existing body. Sukuna's condition isn't the best at the moment. He's also holding back in the first exchange. He's grabbed by Megami's serpent and knocked around with Nue. But Sukuna quickly regains control of the fight within seconds. He makes it clear to Megami that he's done holding back. Then Sukuna perception blitzes him. Megami says that it's not just Sukuna's sorcery and his strength is off the charts. He later compared his experience being blitzed by Sukuna during the Shibuya incident. Toji also blitzed Megami, dashing at him and throwing him out of the building before he even realized he was placed outside. This statement is also heavily debated. It's validity is heavily questioned. Megami was blitzed in both instances. Each time, he's completely unable to react to his opponents. It's hard to prove that Megami could understand his opponent's speed if he's already unresponsive to their movements. Megami could also just not be referencing their speed specifically and instead be comparing the blitz in general. Both of these interactions are Megami being completely unable to respond to his opponents and that's what he's comparing. Both share that similarity and that's what Megami's outlining clearly. He was blitzed in both and that's what he's talking about when he says it's just like that time. However, there's one interpretation where both of these claims could be true. Megami definitely got blitzed, but it's hard to prove that it was a perception blitz. Megami might have seen Toji and Sukuna, but couldn't move his body in response. Megami might not have realized it in the moment, but later on when recounting and comparing the various aspects and similarities to both of these instances, he's drawing the similarities between their speed along with the feeling of being blitzed. Regardless, even potentially being compared to Toji's speed at three fingers worth of his original power is absolutely monstrous. Megami's encounter with Sukuna ends with Yuji taking back control and then ending Sukuna's incarnation. Moments before that, Megami almost summoned the Trump of the Ten Shadows, Maharaga. 
Kaga. This monster's insane strength speaks for itself, and he's by far one of the strongest Shikigami in history. Although Sukuna believes he possibly would have struggled against the Shikigami, this might be for reasons outside of his battle power and strength. Sukuna had just used his domain expansion Malevolent Shrine. He could have been experiencing Curse Technique Burnout. Shortly after ending your domain, Curse Techniques become nearly impossible to control. It's incredibly hard to activate normally after using a domain expansion. You can't exercise Maharaga without having the correct arsenal. Sukuna said this himself, and that he would need to slaughter it with a new attack before it could adapt. Using his domain expansion would have been perfect. We saw that strategy being used during Shibuya, but by potentially not having his Shrine Curse technique, that explains why Sukuna might have thought it would have been more difficult to beat Maharaga. Depending on how strong you think Toji is in Shibuya, which is an entire topic within itself, he could have beaten Obito, who's regarded as the fastest sorcerer aside from Satoru Gojo. Potentially would have beaten Maharaga when possibly starting off without his curse technique. Sukuna, even at three fingers, is a calamity. Then Sukuna consumes even more of his other counterparts, reaching 15 fingers worth of his original power. During Shibuya, the entire city felt his strength the instant he was incarnated inside of Yuji Itadori. Consuming that many fingers at once meant that Sukuna regained control for longer than usual. He temporarily couldn't be forced out by Yuji. Nearly immediately, he draws the line between himself and another special grade curse spirit, Jogo. Jogo was given one of the scariest fades I've ever seen. Sukuna doesn't really have any sort of itinerary. He's not on some specific schedule or plan for this incarnation in Shibuya. He's mostly doing exactly what feels right, acting completely on impulse. Sukuna enters a binding vow that if Jogo could land one attack on him, he'll join him. Jogo isn't weak. He just got done taking down Maki, Naobito, and Nanami within seconds. He's faster than Hanami and on another level compared to Dagon. Jogo isn't weak. Nobody figured that he would come close to beating Sukuna, but maybe it would be slightly challenging in his weakened form. But nope, it's not even close. Sukuna beats down another special grade curse spirit, slamming him through buildings and all around Shibuya. It quickly becomes obvious that Sukuna outclassed Jogo. This is probably the first time that we're beginning to witness Sakuna transcend the normal category for special grade like Satoru Gojo. Jogo is repeatedly blitzed and knocked around. Sakuna retains complete control over the fight throughout each interaction. Kenjaku had mentioned his own estimate for Jogo's power, saying that he's around 8 or 9 finger level. Jogo knew that there was some large disparity that existed between them, but this gap was something unimaginable even according to his own estimation. Nothing within his arsenal comes close to powerful enough to push Sakuna even slightly. Maximum Meteor can damage Sakuna, but it's just too slow. Even aside from his slashing attacks, Sukuna reveals his flame arrow. Shrine itself is complicated and there's an entire video dedicated to explaining the technique on my channel, but without the specifics, you can clearly see how lethal and dangerous each technique becomes and flame arrow isn't an exception. Jogo was burnt instantly even while clashing with his own flames. His body is naturally flaming as he's literally a volcano head, but regardless he was vaporized. Kusakabe later says in Shinjuku that this attack has enough power to instantly take out everybody. Maharaga was also instantly vaporized, being blown to ashes with just one attack that was capable of overriding his adaptation. Maharaga also gets manhandled throughout his brawl with the King of Curses. Despite his monstrous build and insanely powerful abilities, Sukuna maintains control throughout every interaction, dodging attacks easily and even blocking his blade with his bare hands. Even when crashing through multiple buildings, Sukuna brushed off the encounter and easily dodged the Shikigami even while being off his footing. Maharaga was constantly being slashed through completely by Sukuna's dismantles until adaptation began. Maharaga, who'd already beaten the previous 6 Eye user and the head of the Gojo clan, along with every 10 Shadows user who'd ever summoned this monster. That same monster was then dominated by Sukuna. Believe it or not, but it's even worse when you watch the Blu-ray. Shibuya's version of Sukuna at 15 fingers worth of strength quickly became one of the strongest versions of any character within the current series, possibly already surpassing every current special grade aside from Satoru Gojo. Yuji mentions how Yuta Kotsu should be capable of ending Sukuna's incarnation, which then brings their own matchup into question. 15 fingers Sukuna against Yuta Kotsu. You should definitely watch Six's video for a better understanding, but here's the rundown. According to Yuji, they're gonna have insurance against another incarnation by using Yuta Kotsu. Itadori is still mostly in shock over what's recently happened during Shibuya, and his mind isn't clouded, but he's definitely worried about everybody around. He realized that nobody is safe around Sukuna, especially Megami. Yuji asked Yuta to make sure to end his life when Sukuna incarnates. He's more than confident that Yuta is capable. Initially, you would think that Yuji might not have enough info to dictate the potential outcome, but you would be mistaken. He's seen Sukuna firsthand. Yuji has the memories of everything that Sukuna had done in Shibuya. Everything I mentioned before, Itadori has also seen. Even while holding back, Yuta easily managed to capture and exercise Yuji in just a couple minutes. 
Using the statement, initially, it does sound very clear cut. Yuta can kill 15 Finger Sukuna to prevent another chaotic encounter like Shibuya. However, one aspect that Yuji and everybody else who witnessed Shibuya remained completely unaware of was regarding Malevolent Shrine. Not even Satoru Gojo knew about the threat of Sukuna's open barrier expansion. Saving time because this video isn't about domain expansion analysis, open barrier expansion presented clear problems for Yuta's domain. Malevolent Shrine's range far exceeds the parameters of a normal barrier. He's not limited to the lining of his outer shell like many other sorcerers. You could think of the physically represented barriers as giant enclosed boxes. These boxes are then filled with water. This box represents the outer shell. The water is the manifestation of the domain that's being painted and expanded on the walls surrounding the box. Yuta can't create absolutely anything beyond this box while Sukuna's domain isn't limited to any restrictions. Domain expansions in general are weaker to external or outside attacks because they're designed to keep opponents inside so much reinforcement really isn't needed beyond the barrier. Malevolent Shrine uses this aspect to almost instantly dismantle opposing domains, even Satoru Gojo's. Unless Yuta will instantly overpower Sukuna's domain during the clash, Sukuna will either instantly win or stalemate and then win by cracking open his barrier from the outside. Not much explaining is probably necessary to convince you that if Gojo clashed evenly, then Yuta would be lucky to avoid being instantly punished. We could continue to debate between either side, but regardless, nothing could provide an efficient solution to countering that domain expansion. Yuji doesn't know about its lethality in reference to clashing against other swords, it's just harder to claim that Yuta could exercise Sukuna with Malevolent Shrine in mind, making Yuji's statement harder to justify even with our outside perspective. No matter what you believe, there's one thing for sure. Even against other strong sorcerers like Yuta Akotsu, Sukuna deserves to be feared as potentially one of the deadliest opponents that you would ever meet even at only 15 fingers. Shibuya Sukuna didn't just show us about this power pushing other sorcerers. One of the strongest cursed spirits like Jogo and one of the strongest Shikigamis ever in history like Maharaga can all be violated by Sukuna. But our next and final version of Sukuna pushes the sorcerers to their limits. Nobody could forget their encounter with the strongest version of 15 Finger Sukuna. Unknowingly, Yuji was already pre-designed to retain Sukuna. Initially, we believed that he succeeded in becoming Sukuna's vessel despite a very low chance at survival. So let me go over something that I haven't really made clear yet. This entire time whenever I say 3 Finger Sukuna and 15 Finger Sukuna, it's really 4 Finger Sukuna and 16 Finger Sukuna. The reason why I kept him with his old calculations was because that's what most people knew Sukuna by. It's only been made known recently that Yuji was already born with another finger to strengthen himself as a vessel. So this entire time, even before ingesting Sukuna's finger with Megami, Yuji technically had a one finger Sukuna inside of him, it just never incarnated. So really 15 finger Sukuna is 16 finger Sukuna and 3 finger Sukuna is really 4 finger Sukuna. I just kept them with their old calculations because that's what most people know them by, but here you go, that's your disclaimer. Now because of the way that Yuji was born, pre-designed to trap Sukuna and limit his power and lock away the King of curses, Sukuna wanted a way out, and his way out was through Megami. Sukuna could already tell that Megami would make a good vessel. He sensed potential with his curse technique, but he also felt that Megami could also suppress him just like Yuji. Breaking his soul was the plan to ensure that that could never happen. Sukuna force-fed Megami one finger with 15 fingers or really 16 fingers worth of his original power and immediately took control. That moment was when Megami's soul was completely shattered. Sukuna instantly dashes and strikes Itadori's gut before sending him flying completely through a neighboring apartment building. Megami's 10 shadows are then put on full display when Sukuna amplifies Nui with his massive cursed energy output, leading to this monstrous Nui raining down electric strikes. However, this form has one real problem. Sukuna's cursed energy output is currently decreasing when attacking Megami's allies, making Dismantle nearly useless, especially against people like Maki and Yuji, who are two of the most durable fighters in Jujutsu Kaisen. But when forced into hand-to-hand -hand combat, he's perfectly fine maintaining and keeping control against both of them. Sukuna adjusted for his curse technique being ineffective against Maki and Yuji, by also changing his fighting style, keeping himself more defensive and then creating his own openings while also finding ways to incorporate techniques like cleave. Right after this encounter, Sukuna enters the bath, and this continues to sink Megami's soul even further, giving him even more control over his vessel. Yurame says that this bath is surrounded by evil. This was originally done to perfect normal objects into cursed tools, turning Megami into his own cursed tool instead of just a vessel. Turning Megami into his own cursed tool instead of just being a vessel probably made him even stronger. Itadori had become similar in also became just like Sukuna after being dipped within his cursed energy. Sukuna is currently sinking in a cursed energy solution that's completely surrounded by evil. His cursed energy itself has the trait of being evil, so it's only likely amplified when he's soaking himself within the bath, bringing him closer to evil, just like Yurame mentioned. You really see this effect when Sukuna enters Sendai and his presence is felt throughout the entire city. But this doesn't make his new vessel perfect. Sukuna has this cut that doesn't seem to be healed and probably represents the current incompatibility with Megami. Sukuna needs to continue to sink his soul. 
cool. Sukuna easily slices down Ryu. His first attempt didn't cut through, but that makes sense. Among most characters, one of the most durable in the series is Ryu Ishigori. When both Yuji and Yuta, even when Yuta's within his domain expansion, enter Shinjuku, they're both not as durable as Ryu according to Sukuna himself. Ryu actually does better protecting himself with his raw reinforcement than both of them against Sukuna later on. Not cutting completely through Ishigori wouldn't even be that bad, considering Sukuna's not nearly at his full power. But when actually trying to slice him down, Sukuna easily manages to cut through using Dismantle. This severely nerfed Sukuna easily cuts down his opponent that's even more durable than that same Yuta and Yuji that's within Akotsu's domain expansion. We're then watching Irozu and Sukuna, and Sukuna instantly changes his fighting style for this mid-range fighter. Using Megami Shikigami, he can easily close the gap but also keep the distance between himself and Yorozu. When Yorozu becomes more offensive and changes forms, Sukuna is initially pushed back but he maintains his distance and even starts showing off some of the never before seen Shikigami. Sukuna has already come farther in 3 days than Megami did in his entire time studying his own curse technique. He's discovered his own method for adapting Maharago when wearing the wheel that appears to be above the Shikigami. Sukuna can experience the information needed to process adaptations like the ones that we saw during the Shibuya incident, leading to Maharaga pre-adapting before ever summoning this monster to catch unknowing and confused opponents off guard. It's truly one of the greatest strategies and innovations ever created using a curse technique. Maharaga and the rest of the Ten Shadows army is now completely under Sukuna's control, meaning Sukuna now obtained one of the most formidable arsenals in the entire series. After wasting Yorozu and completely sinking down Megami's soul, Sukuna's new form can now be used in perfect condition without any drawbacks. One of the craziest interactions from the Sukuna would be clashing with Satoru Gojo when he was freed from the prison realm when they immediately started to get to the action. It's not even really the clash that's that interesting about that scene, it's the fact that Sukuna doesn't mind fighting Gojo right then and there, despite not reaching 20 fingers of his original power. While not being at full power and only having a couple days to train this vessel, he's already willing to take down the strongest present day sorcerer. Regardless if this confidence actually means he could take down Gojo, which he probably can't, you have to acknowledge the insane power that it takes to even think that something like this would be possible.